T-minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Space race competition to land humans on the moon, the goal set by President Kennedy in 61, seemed to be heating up considerably. One of the major research contributions of TWU involves work with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in which we aid in conserving bone mineral of the astronauts. Dr. Pauline Beery Mack of Texas Woman's University engaged in research for NASA. When we talk about a typical day for Dr. Mack, it might be 24 hours. She was a workaholic. She had a very strong personality. She took over a room. She just was good at conversation, good at interacting people, but she knew her science and she knew how to explain it to people. She came to Texas Women's University from Penn State University. The president then, uh, Milton Eisenhower, allowed her to put in trucks and bring all of her mass human nutrition study from Pennsylvania to Texas. Her husband was still at Penn State. He came when they bought a house. He was a botanist and planned the gardens and planned to retire the next year and come join her. And that did not work out. He died before he could come here but she was very proud of the area around her house, and she followed through with putting the plants in that he had designed. It was a, a, quite a show place. She was the head of the Department of College of Household Arts and Sciences, and uh, she hired me, and so she, I considered her my boss. I came to TWU to get my master's in nutrition, and bone density was my area, and Dr. Mack was my major professor. I worked in the bone density lab as a graduate assistant. It is interesting that she came to Texas Women's University, but I think John Gwynn really wanted a woman in a major role to set that tone for a woman's university. She was a chemistry major to begin with and she was recognized as a chemist. She won a significant medal, the Garvan Medal, and she used that chemistry knowledge to go into bone density. When she got the uh, grant from NASA, uh, she, she wrote a grant and sent it to them and they funded it for her to do work for them. I left my teaching job and became the research dietitian for the NASA grants and enrolled in a PhD program. And we had NASA projects from 1962 to about the end of the 60s. And it was an important part of the space program. I mean, it wasn't putting a rocket into space, it was fact actually taking care of the astronauts that went into space. NASA wanted to study what weightlessness would do to the people who went into space. So we know that when you go into space, the rate at which you lose bone is 10 times the amount that's observed in postmenopausal women on Earth. So that is significant, right? So if you remove gravity, if you go into a microgravity environment, bone loss occurs, muscle loss and atrophy occurs. And it's because of the fluid shifts that take place in the body. All of your fluid shifts to the, your upper, upper part of your body, which tells the bones that they're not being, um, there's no gravitational force. 
best, this is what precipitates the tremendous bone loss um, that occurs in space. And Dr. Mack was able to show that, you know, fifth, no, well, 60 years, uh, 60 years ago. What we know, how you can simulate microgravity type of conditions is bed rest studies, right? Bed rest was used as a way of studying people on Earth to be like being in space. My mother, who worked in the textile department at TWU, said there was an opening for subjects of a study that Dr. Pauline Barry Mack was going to do that summer, where we would basically lay in bed for 30 days. They stayed in a recumbent position and were fed in a recumbent position. So this was six weeks of lying down. Well, the minute I got hired by Dr. Mack, uh, I began their diet. We had little cubes of food and we determined that they all tasted pretty much the same. It's the way they were named. If it was a cheesecake cube, it really didn't taste very good because it tasted just like the toast cube. They would come in now every day and take us into an x-ray lab. She used a system in which they x-rayed the, the heel bone, the oscalsis, with a wedge of aluminum that you knew the density of. This was all done by hand. That's what was so incredible. She invented this wedge. The TWU wedge was used in the original N. Haines study, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, was started in the 1970s, continues to this very day, but the original studies used that TWU wedge. We eventually learned bed rest was pretty bad for people, that they lost even more bone density than they would in weightlessness. We learned so much that extended beyond space about the health of people and about the importance of activity from those bed rest studies. Some of the biggest issues today are um, education about how to eat more healthfully, um, how to move on a, on a regular basis because there is such a huge connection between physical activity, our diet, and our bones. Um, but I also would like people to know that there are solutions even if they have problems, that they don't have to uh, resign themselves to a life of, of osteoporosis. There are solutions. Radio and TV and newspapers came. Um, Lady Bird Johnson came. Dr. Mack was one of these pioneering ladies that determined how to measure, not only uh, measure bone mass, but to characterize it in astronauts before and after their space flights, especially in the early days of space flight in the 1960s. Part of our challenge today for space travel is we can't go to, to Mars until we solve this problem of um, mobilizing bone during space travel. And we were involved from early on with those, the ones that were orbiting the Earth, and then uh, the Gemini flights, and then the one that went to the moon. She went to whatever site she could go when astronauts landed, and she x-rayed them at whatever site that they launched from also. Those men were going to be in a weightless situation, no stress on their bones, and uh, what we found was that they were losing a lot of calcium, more than they should have been from a day-to-day -day walk of life. Uh, Bill Stover was our x-ray technician and he and Dr. Mack did a lot of traveling together. And we had a space flight that involved collecting data from the astronauts she had to send Bill to do it because they, they didn't allow women on board ship. So she was never allowed to um, get that first-hand look at the astronauts when they came out of the water. Um, he always had to do that, so <laughs> I'm sure that was frustrating to her. 
because she, she didn't see any difference between men and women, and she certainly employed lots of men around her. I believe what she did set up many of the studies that are happening today, uh, and a lot of the countermeasures that, that NASA has undergone with their astronauts to try to prevent bone loss in space, including nutrient supplementation and exercise. I believe Dr. Mack was very, very instrumental in setting up that type of research. It's not just engineering things that are important, but the human aspects of space are an important thing also. And Dr. Mack established that because human beings surviving in space was an important part of her research. So several years ago, some people from the um, Johnson Space Center and NASA came to visit TWU just to, to learn a little bit more about Dr. Mack's work and, and uh, her affiliation with TWU. And before they left, they encouraged us to join the Texas Space Grant Consortium. So we did that, and um, it was through the Texas Space Grant Consortium that we learned about this um, competition for the students. The Texas Space Grant Consortium developed what was called the NASA Challenge. And this challenge was to um, help NASA answer the many, many questions they have that are, that are unanswered. And it's also to stir interest with students. Shannon Mantero, who is in the Center for Women in Business, and I went to the um, NASA Design Challenge two years ago. And TWU didn't have a team there. We were just kind of trying to see what was happening with that design challenge. And so we went and uh, as, as luck had it, we sat at a table with one of the astronauts who was a judge for the competition that day. And he asked what we thought about the competition and we said, well, it's wonderful, but you know what's missing from all of the projects is the human element. You're talking a lot about uh, technology and pieces of equipment but there's not very much discussion about the people. Well, TWU took their first role with it and we had a kinesiology-based challenge or a health-based challenge. A big purpose of this design challenge is to have these groups of undergraduates, mostly seniors on these teams, uh, take a need that NASA has and help them try to solve a problem. Astronauts are gonna face kind of a lot of physical challenges um, in space and the records indicated that low back pain had the highest incidence, so that's why we tended to go that way. My idea was to create our own full body electrical stimulation suit. It was a little out there, but what we decided to do after that was to incorporate some of these um, features of the design and kind of simplify it, but also make it to where um, we could do more research into this, this electrical stimulation suit because the designs that have already been made, they're mostly focusing on like how can we bulk people up. The focus wasn't as much on reducing pain as it was um, creating some muscular hypertrophy effects and so we needed to create something a little simpler that way we could do research and actually see if this is actually effective, if this is something NASA can use. This this garment that helps uh, is with integrated neuromuscular electrical stimulation that helps uh, mitigate low back pain in space. Uh, that was a few team members' ideas all put together, you know, so great collaboration and great teamwork here. TWU itself helped in a tremendous fashion interdepartmentally. So the fashion and textile department, they helped us actually craft a, a garment that we were going for in our design. The visual arts department helped us put our patch design into a digital format. And then the Center for Student Research, um, led by Dr. Diana Elrod, she helped us by purchasing the three-dimensional design software that we needed to ultimately draft and conceptualize our design. We traveled down to Houston in League City, which is right down the street from NASA itself, to present um, at the South Shore Harbor Resort. They won overall. It was something that was um, we did not think would be possible because um, we were competing against large schools with colleges of engineering. One of the things about Dr. Mack, based on the things that I've read, um, is there were not a lot of paths for women like her. Right, so she had to make her own path. 
And that was one of the things that I sort of thought about with our team, is there really wasn't a path for a team from a primarily women's university without an engineering program. But that didn't stop them. They were willing to make a path for themselves, like Dr. Mack was. My son talks about being an astronaut, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, we can talk about that. But no, that would be the coolest thing. I mean, hopefully, by the time my son's my age, it'll be like, <laughs> Mars is so last year, so <laughs> what's next? As a research scientist, I believe Dr. Mack would be impressed with what our team has done. There were few women in her generation who set such a role for other women without intentionally doing it. It was the process of doing her job and doing it well. And the creativeness to reach into areas that most women didn't think about going into, into space. The fact that she was born before 1900 and was able to make her way to three different institutions, teaching science courses. Trailblazer, yes. Pioneer, yes. And we get to continue on her trajectory and I get to train undergraduate researchers now. I get to work with graduate researchers and great faculty here who believe that all women have a role in science. She set that first model of being involved in the process of Americans going into space. She understood that there's a strong connection between what we eat, what we do, and our longevity, because um, she looked at people between ages of two and 72, I believe, in the original study, and she was able to pinpoint some of the things that we today, I think, take for granted, that um, we are what we eat, we are what we do. So her story just needs to be out there. It needs to be told to the future generations. Those bone density studies, we didn't really recognize how important that was for several years. So it wasn't high profile and she wasn't getting a lot of out of girls, but she kept on going. Dr. Mack taught me that you just didn't accept no the first time. You just kept working until you got it done.